you. Uh, you'll pardon me sitting down, but uh, I'm getting old. <laughs> and the alternative isn't too good. Anyway, uh, on the handout, you will see the two classifications of jade. Uh, for you GGs that are here, which there are many, you will understand it probably without me explaining it, but I'm going to explain it somewhat. Uh, I am going to concentrate on JDI. Why? That's where the money is. Okay? Uh, Nephrite jade is sold by the pound or kilo. JDI jade is sold by the piece or per carat. It is, uh, every piece is different. I call as the Chinese did in originally naming the jade uh, yin, which has the female characteristic of Chinese. So like a woman, every piece of jade is different. Anyway, uh, I want to give a little historical background first on the jade, which uh, on jadeite and nephrite. And I do have samples up here of various colors and various qualities and various carvings. I have hundreds of them, so room would not be allowing nor time. And if uh, any of you wish to uh, fall asleep before I do, please let me know. <laughs> Chinese culture has valued and appreciated jade for thousands of years, going back uh, almost 3,000 years before Christ. So it is a stone that is mysterious, but yet highly prized and, and very esoteric, having qualities imbued to the culture of China to begin with and with other cultures that we know of. Uh, ever since uh, the 20th century, uh, I take that back, the 18th century, uh, jadeite became the darling of the court, the Chinese court, meaning uh, the king, Xianlong. In the Xianlong dynasty, jadeite, which is the gem quality jade versus nephrite became a jewelry item and it became an amulet. And the story goes that Chen Lung gave a very beautiful uh, jadeite carving of a pepper to his primary concubine. And uh, this piece was treasured and passed through the years and eventually ended up in an auction in Europe and was sold for untold hundreds of thousands of dollars. He, being a lover of art and the fineries of decorative arts, really was the first emperor of China to really appreciate jadeite and how it could be transformed into jewelry and accessories for wearing. Previously, jadeite was not in demand. It, the mines were not significantly worked and the jade that was around and carved was primarily nephrite but not so much in the dark green colors that uh, we all are aware of, such as this bracelet, but in the white colors, the gray colors, the uh, Ming period, uh, brown pieces, uh, many, many colors. And that's one of the things about jadeite that makes it such a wonderful stone is it does come 
in a myriad of colors. And uh, to continue with this historical background, I would say that the Chinese carving of jade uh, developed gradually over uh, thousands of years, and the beginning carvings were done as mythological pieces representing animals, spirits, demigods, and gods of sorts uh, to the early, early religious ceremonies. They were used in ceremonies and they had a lot of significance. Uh, they were used more for religious ceremonies than they were for uh, implements. Although, if you look at your sheet, the, the handout, the jade is significantly hard. It's uh, on the Mohs scale, nephrite is six. So it made an excellent tool and there was some early arrowheads and knives made from jade that were nephrite jade, which were used in the everyday life of the early Chinese. The early uses of these uh, jade uh, thing, uh, implements also employed a significant religious ceremony of plugging all the orifices in the body upon death. And uh, there was small carvings made for the ears, the nose, the mouth, uh, and I'll leave the rest to your imagination. Uh, and many of the most important noblemen and uh, individuals that were in the court were buried in jade suits. These suits were made out of numerous plaques of nephrite, which were wired together with metal wire, and it was to be the protection of the body, and even the head was covered with a mask of jade. These have been dug up, and, and they, they go all the way back to the Han Dynasty and earlier. I have personally examined suits of this nature in museums, and it is uh, incredible the weight of these things. They weigh hundreds of pounds, and uh, to think that they must have put the suits on before they, they could carry the body, because I don't know how they could carry this thing with a body in it and the suit, it was it, unbelievable. They were well carved as far as the mask and the ears uh, and the nose and the mouth goes. They had lips, the ears, nostrils, and then the rest was covered with plaques all the way down to leggings and uh, boots made of jade plaques all wired together. So thus began the mystery gem, Jay, that we all don't know enough about. I do want to ask if, and I'm not going to ask for the GGs, but how many people here who are not GGs know how to tell the difference between nephrite and jadeite? Would you raise your hand if you could tell the difference between <laughs> nephrite and jadeite? Not the GGs, we know you should know. Okay. Nephrite, and that's just a few. Nephrite is, a, uh, as you see on your handout, the main difference is the fibrous structure of the material, of the rock. The jadeite has a crystalline structure, and the best way to describe it in layman's term, with magnification, it shows a granular crystal structure. When you look at nephrite under a strong light with magnification, you will see more like hair-like fibrous inclusions, and that is how the material has been formed. 
it was formed totally different than the jadeite. And thus it is, although it has some of the same properties as jadeite, it is not as hard usually. It will, it will scratch with the mode test around a six. Jadeite normally is at least six and a half and I've seen it go all the way up to seven. And that makes it a very hard, tough material. Consequently, it renders itself for very fine carving. The harder the material, the more detail you can get out of a fine carved surface. Now, this hardness also comes with a brittleness. So, just because it's hard doesn't mean it won't break. You drop a jade bracelet on concrete, it's definitely gonna break. But, but, normal wear, jadeite will last thousands of years without throwing it against the wall or the floor. <laughs> anyway, to continue, the uh, most uh, early 20th century, was when jadeite was really used significantly for jewelry. It first entered the jewelry market during the Victorian era in England and in Boston, because Boston was our main seaport with trade to the Orient. So uh, as much as we think of Seattle and LA and San Francisco, they were hamlets in the 1850s and 60s. But Boston was already a very significant city. And since the 18th century, trade from China was mainly in the port of Boston. So porcelain, jade, ivory, things like that were all brought in to Boston in those times. Don't try to find any in Boston now, though, because it's pretty scarce. I've been there. <laughs> Jadeite uh, will take a very high polish due to its hardness and its structure. The nephrite will not take quite as good a polish because it's a, a lower hardness, and the fibrous nature of it is a little bit difficult to, to get as high and fine polish. Today, jadeite is polished with uh, diamond dust for a quick, quicker method of polishing it on a lapidary wheel. In the early days, jadeite was polished by the Chinese artisans using powdered ruby, sapphire, corundum, which is the scientific name for those minerals. And they also used garnet, which we'd use today in sandpaper, but it took longer. And in some cases, they uh, used a special sand that was, uh, as we know, silica, but it didn't create the polish that uh, the ruby and sapphire dust did. And rubies coming from Burma and sapphires coming from Burma, they were traded to China and the lower quality ones were ground up and put with a uh, grease that was made from animal fat. And then the particular artisan would use the early primitive tools to polish this jade and the RPMs on his treadle powered, like an old sewing machine, treadle power carving instrument was so much slower than what we have today with electric tools. And this is one of the ways in determining the age of a carved jade piece. Uh, I have done it for many, many years and jade is probably the most difficult 
carved mineral to determine age on you have to look at it under high magnification and generally speaking anything that has been carved a hard stone such as jade or agate or quartz would show some slippage from the electric tools the electric wheels that we would use today, electric motor powered wheels. So under high magnification, you can usually determine what, what I call slippage. Slippage is hills and valleys that show up on the surface of the piece, meaning that it's not a perfectly smooth surface. Now this isn't 100%, but it's pretty much in the 90 to 95% realm of identifying old pieces versus new. Of course, in today's world, old pieces are much more valued than new pieces when you are looking strictly at the carving. Uh, some of the material that was carved in the early days has no significant value for the mineral as such, but the carvings being done for months and sometimes for years on one piece because of the tedious nature and the lack of motor driven tools, it's just phenomenal how they were able to create these pieces. Some of the carvers, the early carvers, apparently spent a lifetime just making a few pieces of carved jadeite or nephrite. In the, uh, of course, in the 18th century, uh, the emperor, Jin Long, had his own artisans and set up the imperial workshops, not only for gems and jade, but also for other artistry, such as furniture making, painting, porcelain making, and the items that were produced then in the uh, palace area were always of the finest quality and you know some of it slipped out the gate or through the front door or the back door it didn't all just stay in the palace because there was hundreds of artisans working there going on with the current day today use of jade it is of course the darling stone of the of asia and the fact that it is a mystery to most Westerners makes it a little bit difficult to understand. The carvings done on jade, when we're talking about carvings, they all have symbolism that is important to the Chinese culture. And I would like to start with some slides now. This, of course, everyone knows is the Happy Buddha. And this has been used for 200 years, at least, in carvings. This one happens to be jadeite, and it's probably not very old. Uh, let's go to the next one. This is a mountain scene. Hold up the microphone. And this is a mountain scene of uh, dark uh, nephrite that was mounted in, with an ivory background and an enamel base in silver. And I believe this piece was made by Cartier. It was simply a table ornament. Next. The carving on the last one was 18th century and it was probably mounted in the 1920s or 30s. This again is a Cartier piece representing uh, a table uh, ornament, accessory. The two jade pieces, although they're coming out very dark green, are jadeite. The rest of it is uh, black onyx, not black jade. It is uh, the phoenix and dragon chasing the uh, heavenly pearl, which is carved out of coral. And this piece uh, is worth 
approximately three to four hundred thousand dollars. Next. Uh, this didn't come out too well. I own this piece. This is actually an Art Nouveau piece made by Liberty of London, one of the most uh, well-known stores in London. It came, come, comes in a fitted box, and it's a group of grapes uh, with the leaves, and the attachment at the top was not made in China. That was probably done in London because it's platinum and diamonds. And this was probably mounted sometime around 1920. When was the jade carved? The carving is a probably turn of the century, 1890 to 1900, based on the nature and style of the carving. The other point is it's carved on both sides. Back after World War II, all the carvings primarily were done one-sided for jewelry. Carvings that were meant to be mounted in jewelry after World War II have a flat, polished back, whereas the earlier carvings always were fully dimensional. Next. This again is a dragon mounted as a brooch or pendant with diamonds. The, the carving is probably early 20th century. Next. Here we have a very typical pendant. Uh, also, it's coming a bit dark. It's not as dark as it appears. And it is jadeite. And this is carved with a lotus leaf, the large lotus leaf at the bottom, and lotus blossoms, uh, which, and it would be carved very similarly on the back to the point of like a large carving that I brought here, a pendant. If it has a flower, the carving would show the front of the flower and the back would show the back of the flower. So it's fully dimensional. Next. These are uh, two catfish and uh, why two? Well, the Chinese have a saying, two is always better than one. And good luck, their good luck symbol, Song Hei, is double good luck. So it's not unusual to see two animals together that have a significant cultural meaning. Next. This is a carving of the Buddhist knot or the eternal knot. Uh, this is carved on both sides also. Whereas the brooch next to it was made in Hong Kong in the 1960s and is mounted with normal cabochons. Next. These are hairpins and they have a twisted rope design of the jade. And these were quite common in the late 19th century and early 20th century and they were worn in the fancy hairdresses Hair, hair buns or whatever uh, that they wore in the court. They were probably used by one of the uh, concubines or one of the court ladies. Next. Here again, we have a smattering of age. The, the middle piece is a hair knot bar. It has been broken or cut, and it went through the hair knot on the top of the head, and the hair was twisted around it and knotted. And I have seen many of these from both the 19th century and the 18th century in Jadeite. The earrings at the lower right corner are typical early Chinese earrings, no metal. Uh, 
they were very finely carved with a very fine post, curved post to go into the ear. So the Chinese kind of invented earrings because those are probably 18th century. Next. Uh, this is a tubular shaped piece which also bore significance uh, of being uh, a part of the circular art of China going back thousands of years because there's no beginning and there's no end. So it has an infinity meaning. And it is jadeite in a modeled material. And many of these will come up that have been made into pendants, into earrings, into various pieces, but this is a, quite an old one. Next. Here again is a Buddha that I believe this one was mounted by Cartier again, made in the early 20s and set with diamonds and uh, gold and rubies. Next. This was a piece that was a typical 18th century Chinese jade kailin or water dragon belt buckle. Chinese invented the belt buckle and they invented the button. I have a jade button here on the table. This was worn with a cloth sash Let's see if I have the back side of it. It was sold at uh, Butterfields a number of years ago for quite a bit of money. I think it was almost $100,000. The embellishment was done by Cartier. In the early uh, part of the 20th century, many of the jewelers were fascinated with the Oriental art, and in, especially in the 20s, the homes were decorated with a lot of Asian items. And so the jewelers jumped on the bandwagon and began incorporating early jade pieces into newer concepts. And they used platinum, gold, enamel, all of that is here. And of course, diamonds, rubies, precious stones, but the piece itself, the jade carving, is 18th century sash buckle. On the back side, it will have a button that is in relief. And the head, the button will be down at this end, the lower end, and the head was grasped by what they call a frog, which is a, a cord loop around the head, and then the back side had the button that went through a hole in the fabric or leather. Next. There it is again with a fine jade ring that was in the same auction at Butterfields. That ring we call a saddle ring because of the shape of the jade. It is a, a piece that was probably a full ring out of jade and got cut off or broken. The bottom part would have been part of the same piece of jade, usually not the same color as the top cabochon, and many times they were cut because the bottom part was too small, the size was too small as the Asian fingers were not like the Western fingers and mounted this way. They are still mounted in precious metal and stones in this manner. Next. This again is a modern piece, again with an old carving of a dragon that's coiled. And it was mounted in the Art Deco style, but it is a reproduction. And the jade again is a deep green color. Next. This is a eggplant, and it has a lot of significance in Chinese culture. It's a pendant, and it was carved out of highly translucent jadeite. 
nice, very nice quality. The tendrils coming down. Next. This is a typical carving from the 20th century, done probably in the 1930s in China. You see the carving is not as refined as what we had on the other pieces. It's a group of flowers and berries. Next. Here is a pair, a rare pair of lavender jade bangle bracelets. Now, when you see the bangles that are totally tubular in shape, they're usually the older bangles. The newer bangles, like this one, are flattened on the inside. Why? Takes less jade. Uh, the biggest loss in making jade jewelry is in making a bangle or beads. Because this stacks off as a slice of a block. And then they core out the center. If there's any color in the boulder in the center, then that is reused for carving smaller pieces. But in making a bangle, there's more waste than any other type of carving. And especially when it's rounded like these, the newer bracelets, and this is a modern bracelet made in the old style, but the inside is flat. Now, that works on jadeite, but back in the Ming period and earlier, going back thousands of years, the insides of the bracelets were flat because they were much wider and they would have been tremendously heavy and they were worn mostly by men than the bracelets. This is a man's bracelet because of the size. Uh, this, this pair of natural lavender jade, which the lavender is created by the manganese which is in the uh, material. All the colors in jadeite are caused by impurities in the jadeite. So white jade, when it is jadeite in Chinese, the word for it means pure jade because it does not have any impurities in it. And if it's crystalline, they now call it ice jade or water jade and I have a couple of bracelets up here that are ice jade. That has become very, very costly due to a fashion trend in China. Next. This is a pair of bracelets that were probably done in the early 19th century, and they're totally uh, uh, reticulated with carving on both sides. Uh, and they were uh, dark green jadeite, beautifully carved with flowers, totally pierced, totally three-dimensional. Here again, the, they are rounded. You can't tell that from this picture, but they're totally rounded on the inside, unlike the flattened ones today. Next. Here is what we call moss and snow or the Chinese call moss and snow. It is white jadeite, highly crystalline, with green spots. Again, an older bracelet, and we do have some examples of this here. Next. This is uh, not showing up, but it's a highly translucent jadeite bangle uh, that sold about 20 years ago for $100,000. Next. Here again is a highly trans translucent lavender jade with the color variation. Now, there's some white and some lavender. And I have, this one is green and brown. The brown is the outer part of the boulder, which achieved uh, the color from millions of years of exposure to the iron uh, elements. Next. 
Here again is a jadeite bangle, more modeled with uh, splashes of white in it, but a little more consistent coloring. Next. This is a Cartier clock, and this is all jadeite pieces that were cut in the 1920s for the clock. The clock itself is set with diamonds. The top piece is a carving that predates the rest of it. The, that is a ninth, early 19th century carving. So Louis Cartier had a, a whole contingency of buyers that were going to Shanghai and to Beijing and buying carvings, which he could use with all of his clocks and objects of art and jewelry. Next. No, the red on that is enamel. That is enamel. I have seen this clock. This clock is worth a half a million dollars. This is a piece that I have here. It, the picture does not do it justice. It is signed, it was made in the 1920s by a well-known firm in New York called Dreiser. And the piece is uh, a remounted piece. The, as a brooch, and it's not a large brooch, the jade in it obviously had been worn in a ring previously and then been remounted in the 20s because there's a lot of scratches on the top surface of the cabochon. Next. Uh, this is, uh, as I recall, a Fabergé box in nephrite it came with a group of things in an auction. And this is the dark spinach green nephrite, like what I have here. Very little value to the material, but it made an excellent vehicle for a cigarette case. Next. Here again is a box by Cartier, much in the manner of the clock and this is very modeled jadeite, and this plaque is probably early 19th century, as best as I can tell. And it's been remounted back in the 20s in a gold platinum enamel case for cigarettes. Next. There's another box, also Cartier. Incredible craftsmanship and these pieces are in <coughs> sections and they came that way because they were sewn on to sleeves of garments and the purpose of there's a reason for every Chinese carving no matter how artistic it is there is always a utilitarian use. These highly pierced pieces were frequently sewn onto robes and to hats that the Chinese wore. It was a sign of wealth. Next. There here again are some Cartier pieces that are mounted with not so valuable jade, but they used it for the color effect and to give that oriental mystique to the Art Deco jewelry. This was all made in the 20s and 30s. Next. This was a piece that uh, we originally appraised and it belonged to a very important uh, family here in San Francisco. And the buckle is 18th century. The pendant is 18th century. And it also depicts probably uh, pumpkins with leaves. And it's mounted by Cartier. And it belonged to a well-known family here in the city. One of the early families from the Levi Strauss group. Next. 
Now that's a continuous band of J. Picture's not good enough. Sorry about that. These were made beginning in the uh, 19, late 19th century up through today. And again, they're made like a miniature bracelet and they're flat on the inside. The old ones were not made this way. So when you see a ring like this, it's a continuous hololith it will be um, more modern, 20th century or current. Next. These again are a pair of peacocks or phoenix birds. These are made early 20th century. You see how the carving is not as detailed as the earlier ones. These were also probably made in the 20s and carved in the 20s to be exported <coughs> next. These are a pair of earrings that um, I had, and they are again carved with peaches. Peaches with leaves. And each one should have two or three peaches. It's very seldom that you see one peach on a piece. Uh, two, like I said, are always better than one and they are very translucent jade. Next. <coughs> this is a typical 20th, early 20th century shape, the marquee jades. This was not early, jade was not cut this way. But the interesting part is these are deco style earrings, the top two pieces were probably carved a hundred years before the bottom two pieces. They are cabochons that are slightly irregular. And to get to the point of the carving of jade, the early cabochons were always double capped, meaning the back of it was rounded. Why? They did not have electric saws to saw the jade into slabs. They cut the jade with metal saws that were thin wire. And the wire was not, you, they could not maintain a real straight line. So after it was cut, they rounded it off with a lapidary. They could never get a super flat cut on the jade in the early days because these wires were hand saws. They were not operated uh, or they were operated on a treadle machine uh, by foot, like a foot bow or a hand bow for drilling and cutting. Next. Here is a pair of triple loops. They are carved out of one, each one is carved out of one piece of jade. Very difficult to make. Uh, I think I brought some in white jade. I don't remember if I brought them or not. Uh, these are, again, a symbol of infinity. And to be able to carve this with the element, elementary tools they had, it's just phenomenal. Next. Here's a pair of jadeite earrings that brought uh, a long time ago. They brought almost $200,000. They're large cabochons. Next. This is a small carving. I don't think we have it. Yeah, it's a monkey, but on a peach. And if we turn it, it's turned the wrong way. The, the slide is, anyway, this has a lot of uh, significance. Uh, monkeys are gregarious, smart, and the peach is a symbol of long life and abundance. Next. Another model bracelet. Now here's a good example. Lavender here on one side of the boulder that it was carved out of, and then green on the other side. Next. 
Here again, we have a multicolored bangle with the brown, which was the outer part of the boulder, which got the oxidation. Jade is a, a jadeite, for the most part, is alluvial, meaning it is found in riverbeds and on the surface of the ground. It is not like digging tunnels to dig out gold ore or coal. It was found in large boulders. The boulders range from the size of your little finger to an automobile size. The bigger boulders have been found more recently. They were too and used more recently for carving because they were too heavy to be transported because all this jadeite comes from one area in Burma. The area in Burma is called the Kachin Valley, K-A-C-H-I-N. This mine where all these jadeite boulders are is controlled by a local tribe, the Kachin tribe, and the Burmese military. They have been fighting over this for hundreds of years, and the land uh, is basically owned by the tribe. The area is sealed off completely. No visitors are allowed. Now, about six years ago, I think in 2000, maybe a little bit longer, I'm not sure of the date, two reporters did a documentary book called, the name of the book is Stone of Heaven. And this is probably the, the biggest expose of the jade mining and jade industry that's ever been written. Uh, they were sequestered into the mine area by paying off a lot of money to the military there and were able to witness the mining of the jade in the Burmese a valley called the Kachin Valley. Next, here is a highly trans translucent bangle. Here again, we have to talk about, and I will display it on the board, the in assessing the value of jade, how it's done and, and in what order. Next. Again, highly transis, translucent. This is similar to a ring that I have here, and this is called the oil green color because it's so translucent in deep green. Next. Uh, these are Art Deco cufflinks made with jade cabochons that were cut from beads, beads that were split, early beads. Next. Again, two very valuable modern earrings with cabochons. Next. This is a ring that brought half a million dollars at auction. It's a large cabochon. And uh, at this point, I'll and go to the valuation uh, situation because everybody likes money and they want to know <laughs> what is it worth? Well, the first thing we'll start off with is three types of jadeite that are on the market today. A jade, That's totally natural. Now this business of A, B, and C was invented in the last 20 years by the market in Hong Kong. <coughs> B, J, this is, I'm gonna put a star here. This is all natural, no treatment, only polished. BJ is polymer impregnated. Impregnated. And now 
I'll explain the whole process of the BJ. I have a bracelet here that I'm going to pass around. Please don't drop it. <laughs> Not that it's so valuable, but this is a typical example of a piece of jade that would have been much better if it had been treated with the polymer. It is natural. Now you will see that it looks real dingy. It has some green splashes in it and it has a lot of brown and black. And uh, this one never got treated, but this is the type of material that they use for treatment. So needless to say, the material starts off not very pretty. It may have a few green splashes of modeling in it, but the rest of it will be uh, dark brown, blackish, grayish uh, spots. So what do they do? First, number one, they bleach it. Now this is always before it's been cut. They take the material and it has already been roughed out and it's bleached in acid. Basically, it's cooked in acid. The acid will eat out all these dark spots and impurities and leave voids, spider web cracks. Uh, depending all the way down to little cabochons, little stones are done this way. And then it's infused or impregnated, whatever you want to call it, under pressure with epoxine, which is a polymer. Epoxine is just a fancy word for epoxy. It's infused with epoxy. So this is BJ. This is the most common jade on the market today. What is it worth? Not much. Not much at all. You can buy a nice bangle bracelet for a couple of hundred dollars. Whereas if that bracelet was natural, it would be a hundred thousand dollars. Then we have CJ. C should stand for crap. <laughs> but, because that's what it is. They've taken the worst jade that they can find. They cook the heck out of it in acid and they infuse it with epoxine and dye. So not only here on BJ, the epoxy is clear. It has no color in it. On the C jade, it has color. And this is what you will see on the street in Hong Kong being sold for five, ten dollars in Chinatown in here. Market at huh, yeah. Any tourist spots, you will see beads and it looks beautiful, but it's probably 50 to 60 percent of it is in jade. It's got the epoxy in it because after the it's it's uh, infused with the epoxy. They have to repolish it. So you people that use microscopes and loops, the way to tell quickly, 90% correct, I'm not going to say 100, is to use a high-powered magnification and look at the surface of the J. The surface will let me clean this up. Now, even GIA is using A, B, and C. I have some GIA reports here for the J that has come out, A, B, and C. I, I don't know about C, but I know they use A and B 
because it's a common term that was invented in Hong Kong because it made it a little bit easier to grasp whether it's natural jadeite or treated jadeite by putting A, B, and C. And B really stands for the bleaching process and C for the coloring process. But if you take a jade cabochon and number one, you look at the surface and a strong light on top will give you the reflection of the surface. Spider web, very minute, probably around a tenth of a millimeter openings. And that's where the acid ate into the jade. So it could be infused. Now, it's only under high magnification usually that you can see this. The problem is when they pop, have to repolish it after it's been infused,